thank you very much. Uh, what little time I've been here, I have really enjoyed it. A lovely place to be. Uh, very impressed with many things God is doing here in your church. <clears throat> I only have one disappointment, and that is that I could not bring my wife, Teresa, with me. She's an awesome woman, and I married a beautiful wife. Now, any husband who's wise says that, but I can prove it. Almost every time we go through an airport or in a mall or someplace out pre-COVID, someone would walk up to her and say, has anyone told you, you look like Sophia Loren? Now, for those of you who are 45 and younger, you have no idea who I'm talking about. For those of you who are older, you know I married up. To use a sporting metaphor, I outkicked my coverage. And when we're ready, getting ready to go out, and she disappears as all women do to get ready. She reappears, the dress fits perfectly. The hair is gorgeous, all the accessories match, her eyes sparkle. I say to her, you know, image is everything. And she laughs and I laugh because we know that is not true. In the last couple of decades in our country, we have watched major corporations who had projected an image, an image of honesty, integrity, trustworthiness. And then we have seen as some of their leaders have gone to jail because the image and the essence did not fit. But I want to turn that around. Essence, truth, without image, seldom accomplishes much. That's also why corporations spend millions of dollars projecting an image. I'm told I need a truck that is ram tough. I need a piece of the rock. If my digital equipment does not have a half-eaten piece of fruit on it, I have the wrong equipment. My athletic equipment must have a swish on it. Why do they do that? Because they understand that image produces hope. If you think about it, hope is one of the major ideas of Scripture. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 talked about faith, love, and hope. He said of those three, love is most important. The writer to the book of Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. But here's what we've learned. People can live without love. It makes life really hard, but they can. People can live without faith. It makes life even more complicated but they can. But most people cannot live without hope. The reason why some people get so desperate they want to take their own life is because they have lost all hope. It's interesting that when the Allies at the end of World War II began to liberate the death camps that the Nazis had created, obviously the prisoners who were killed had no choice in what happened to them. But those prisoners who were still alive that made up the infrastructure of the camp, they heard stories of how many other prisoners deliberately escaped knowing they would get shot or would throw themselves on the electrified fence just to get out of that. But those who were left still had a dream of a book they wanted to write a concert they needed to play, a grandchild that existed somewhere in the world, and they wanted to hug that grandchild at least once before they died. And it was that hope that kept them going. The Bible's way of talking about hope is vision. Without vision, people perish. It doesn't mean we die. It just means that the soul withers up like dust and is blown with the wind. And as I work with many churches, often I go into churches that used to be quite large, they're now small, and the church really has no vision. Or as I work with churches, there's a bigger problem where everybody in the church has a different vision. And people are saying, Pastor, we need to go here, we need to go this way. And it's like eight horses pulling in different directions. But the biggest problem I see in our churches in our nation 
is an incomplete vision. And that's what I want to talk about. To do that, I want to use what many refer to as the real Lord's Prayer. We remember the night before Jesus died, we're going to celebrate that with communion. That when he'd finished that meal with his friends, he left the city and he went out to a garden and he began to pray. And in that prayer, he prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for us. I just want to look at the two requests that Jesus made for himself. Look with me, if you would, at the screen at John 17, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Jesus said, Father, will you glorify me? Will you get people to know me? Will you get people to like me? Will you get people to follow me? When I tell you, that my grandchildren are exceptional. Yours may be average, but mine are exceptional. I'm glorifying my grandchildren. When you say to someone, you should read that book, that was a good movie, you should have seen that movie. We are glorifying that event or that book. And Jesus says, Father, will you get people to know me and like me? I don't know if you ever thought about it, but I've often wondered, when Jesus went back to heaven, how many people on earth were disciples of him? We realize most people on earth didn't even know he had come, didn't know he lived, didn't know he died, didn't know he was raised and went back to heaven. How many people were actually disciples? Now, I went to seminary to learn how to exaggerate. So let's assume there were 10,000 disciples on earth when Jesus went back to heaven. I think that's a really large number. I mean, we know he often fed thousands, but when he started to preach, many of them wouldn't follow him anymore. He did preach to 500 after the resurrection. So let's suppose there were 10,000 people on earth who were followers of Jesus. That's a small number compared to the whole population of the world. Do you realize that since World War II, Christianity has been the fastest growing faith in the world. Those who study missions estimate that 30,000 people a day in China become a brand new disciple of Jesus. The same number is used of Latin America, 30,000 people a day. About a quarter of a century ago, the estimation is that the population of India that were Christian was 1%. Today, the estimation is it's about 25%. In fact, one of the professors at Fuller Seminary that studies all this said, Paul, things are happening so fast in India, we can't keep up with the numbers. Not only has Christianity been the fastest growing faith, in the last three years, Islam has caught up. But if you think of it as a race, they're far out in front of all the other faiths. It's still the largest faith in the world. Africa, south of the Sahara, is considered to be a Christian continent that now sends missionaries all over the world. In fact, there's a church in Nairobi, Kenya, that has five campuses in the United States. China is changing underground. Iran and Iraq, the church is growing. In 1860, the world's largest faith was Buddhism. In 2020, it's Christianity. People often say to me when I work with smaller churches and I ask, do you want to grow? Everybody says, oh, yeah, we'd like to see our church grow. But invariably, somebody says, but we don't want to become a mega church. And anymore, I just say, don't worry about it. You know, it's not going to happen. But I want to tell you, if you don't want to go to a mega church, you don't want to go to heaven. Because after 21 centuries... The Bible tells us that there will be an uncountable number of people who bowed their knee and said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus said, Father, will you glorify me? And the Father has answered that request. Look at the second request in verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Same word for glory. But it's a whole different context. Father, will you give me back my glory? Now, your church, like many eco-churches, 
you're very committed to the scriptures, you're very committed to Bible study, and you realize that when you read the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're told a lot about Jesus. But one thing we're not told is what he looked like. We don't know whether he was tall, whether he was short, whether his features were fine or coarse, the length of his hair. But we all know what Jesus looked like. We've seen the pictures. He was constantly posing. Look at this picture. You can just hear the photographer. Guys, get on one side of the table. You know, crowd in. we got to get you all in the shot. But you have this picture. Or look at this picture. Uh, when I was growing up in church, we had a picture like this behind the past. A great big picture every Sunday. He's got the long California surfer hair. He's got the well-groomed sheep in his arms. In the third grade, if one of my buddies had said, what does Jesus look like? I'd say, come to church. We've got his picture. You can see it. Or, or look at this picture. This one, I think, was done with an iPhone. I'm not sure. Or look at this picture. Now, we know that most of those pictures were painted by artists in the 14, 15, 1600s. They weren't painting what Jesus looked like. They were painting the essence of who Jesus is. And I need those images. I need that image of that person who is both God, knowing everything, all powerful, who is also human. So I can have some identification of who God is. In fact, the Bible says Jesus is my icon. An icon, used, that's what we used to call television tubes. And when you looked at the TV, you knew that was not a real person. That was something that had been shot in a studio. But it was an image of reality. That's who Jesus is. I see God and I see someone who's human. Someone who got hungry. Someone who got tired. Someone whose friends turned on him. I need that image. I need that image of Jesus as the good shepherd. Life is unfair and it's in jest. And the older you get, the more you say, Jesus, do you care for me? Even if I'm alone in, in, in my room because of this pandemic, are you with me? And he says, I am. The image that's on the screen of Jesus on the cross, which we're going to look at in communion of how on that day, that person who was both God and human hung on that cross and God took your sin and my sin and put it on Jesus. And said to him, you will pay the penalty. And you and I have eternal life because of what Jesus did. But if this is the only image we have of Jesus, it's an incomplete image. We do have a description of what Jesus looks like in the Bible. Follow along as I read from the book of Revelation. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. I don't know about you, but I seldom think of Jesus looking like this. But that Sunday morning, as John said as a prisoner on the island of Patmos, and he hears this voice like the sound of rushing wind and thunder and water. He turns and he sees this person who's shining his face like the sun, his feet like bronze. And I want to submit to you that just as the Father has glorified Jesus, he's given him back his glory. And that for two centuries... He probably has not looked like most of the pictures. If anything, he's looked more like this picture. When John saw Jesus as the glorified, resurrected Lord, he's standing in a circle 
of seven candlesticks with seven candles all lit. And in that mighty voice, he says to John, those seven candles represent seven local congregations. Today, we know they are all in that area that we call the nation of Turkey. And he said, John, in a moment, I'm going to dictate a letter to each one of those churches, and I want you to copy it down and send it to them. Each letter was somewhat different because every congregation is unique. But the message to all of the churches was the same. As long as they do what I want, their candle will burn brightly. But if they stop doing what I want, I will take their candle and I'll blow it out. And within three or four hundred years, all of those churches had died. The message was, as long as the church follows me, it will grow. When it stops following me, it will die. Christianity is still, along with Islam now, the fastest growing faith in the world. It's also the largest faith in the world. But there's three places where the church of Jesus Christ is dying Europe, North America, and Australia and New Zealand. The three continents most touched by the Protestant Reformation. In our nation, about 50 years ago, there used to be about a half a million churches in the U.S. that met every weekend. Today, there's about 320,000 churches. The average size congregation in the United States, depending on how you count, is between 25 and 125 uh, in worship attendance. Now you might say, well, you know, our church, we're between 300 and 400. That's like being the best restaurant in the hospital. The church is dying. Your church, the back some years ago, was running at 460 people in average worship. Pre-COVID was at the lower 300s. 80% of all churches in the United States are in plateau or decline, just like your church. And there's only 10% of the churches in the United States that are growing by reaching both Christians and non-Christians. You see, Jesus says, I didn't create the church for Christians. I created the church to mobilize Christians, to make more Christians. And the church in the United States has stopped doing that. And the Lord of the church is going around blowing out candles. The church is growing around the world, but in our nation, even though the population may double, triple, quadruple, 100% around us, most churches are in plateau and decline because most churches put the Christian first rather than obeying Jesus' commission to the church, which is to make more Christians. And we have stopped doing that. That's what the essence of this image reminds me. But this image also offers me hope. I don't know about you, but I'll follow this Jesus anywhere. This Jesus is going to win. And I have seen church after church after church that was in the process of having their candle burn, burn out, turn around and blossom and grow when they said, we will come back and obey the Lord of the church and do what he wants. The last quarter of a century, I've been going to Australia every year. And one of the groups I've gotten to know and work with for about 15 years now is the Salvation Army. When William and Catherine Booth started the army, the reason they started it 
as they were going out in the streets of London, reaching the poor and the disenfranchised and, and those who were the marginalized of society, and they were telling them about Jesus, and when these people would become believers in Jesus and they would bring them to church, the Christians wouldn't let them sit in the worship center. They had to sit in the foyer because they were poor. The Christians didn't want them in there. And so William and Catherine Booth said, well, then we're going to start our own church, and we're going to call it the Salvation Army. And we're going to be about three things. We're going to be about soup, soap, and souls. And we want to see people come to Jesus. When the army got to the nation of Australia in the year 1900, they started in the city of Adelaide. And within 10 years, God did a major work through the army all across the nation. There were churches in Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne and Perth and all these little towns in the outback. The churches were growing. They had churches of 500, 1,000. These churches would go into these little towns, and so many people would come to Christ. The bars would close. The gambling establishments would close. The broth would close. And one of the reasons why the women kept wearing bonnets was to keep the tomatoes off their hair that got thrown at them. But when I began to work with the army about 15 years ago, here's what the leaders told me. They said, Paul, the army is growing we're doing great stuff with soup and soap. We're working with those who are in alcoholic, drug rehab, prisoners. We're seeing God do awesome things, but our churches are dying. In fact, they said the average size congregation now in Australia across the whole nation are 52 people on a Sunday when they used to be 400, 500, 600. They said, do you think God will do something for us to find our churches? I said, yeah. I said, you are doing awesome at the Great Commandment. To be very honest, you stink at the Great Commission. If you are willing to make that your priority, God will turn it around. And God's begun to do that. About five years ago, I was invited to work with a congregation in Sydney in an area called Campsie. Campsy had become the most multicultural center of the city of Sydney. And when I was there that weekend, I've been there two or three times. When you go on the streets, I was the only white person on the street. This church that used to have 500 people and it was down to 70 old white people. None of them lived in the community anymore. They had to commute in every week. Their average age was about 75. And they said, Paul, you're right we got to get serious about the Great Commission. We want to see God grow our church. I said, wonderful. I said, where do you want to grow? They said, we want to grow right here. I said, you know you've got a problem. They said, what's that? I said, you're too pale. Everybody out on the street, or they're from Africa, they're from Asia, they're from the Middle East, and you're all Anglo-Saxon. And they said, we want to reach them. How do we do it? And so... I need to tell you a little bit about Salvation Army worship. It's just as rigid as Presbyterian worship, but it's different. Okay. So I've been in almost 100 churches in Australia. I've never been in a Salvation Army church in the States, but in Australia, I've been in a bunch of their churches. They're all the same. So if you're the congregation up here on the platform pre-COVID, there would be, in this church, there were 10 old men in uniforms because when you join the church in the Salvation Army, that's when you get a uniform. So 10 old men in uniforms playing brass instruments. That's the Salvation Army band. By the way, you know how young people are just grooving to hear brass music. But they're sitting there. Now, the platform is big enough. There used to be 100 in the band. Now there's only 10. On this side of the platform, there's 10 old women in uniforms. That's the choir because historically the men were in the band and the women were the songsters. And in between were the husband and wife Salvation Army pastors, the team. So every Sunday on the platform, in front of these 70 old people, were about 20 old people, all in uniforms, all white, wanting to reach this community that was anything but white. So I said to him, if you really want to see God do the Great Commission in this community, what you are on the platform is what the congregation will become. And so one of the prescriptions I gave them is by such and such a date, half the people on the platform cannot be white and must be under 40, even if you hire people to sit there. I went back to the States. 
I went back two years later, and the church had changed. And here's why. These old men, who now lived in the suburbs, put on their uniforms during the week and went down into the Campsie area, went to all the schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and they said, we are here to give free music lessons to any students who would like music lessons. Now, these men were great musicians because the army competes in bands all around the world. They have great competitions with Christians with Christians. They knew their music. When the women heard about it, they said, see if any of the girls there would like voice lessons. We'll do it for free. And within about three months, every Tuesday night, they had about 40 kids from ages 10 to 18 singing, learning their music. And that was great for two months until the Asian parents came to the meeting. They said, here's the problem. We're delighted that you care about our children. We're delighted you're giving them free music lessons, but here's the problem. We don't want them learning brass. We want them learning violin, flute, because these parents could one day hopefully see their son or daughter playing at the Sydney Opera House. Now these old men, who from the history of William and Catherine Booth had been the Salvation Army band, had to make a choice. Will we become the band or will we be the orchestra? And they said, if it helps us reach this community, we'll become the orchestra. And then they divided these 40, 50 kids up into two groups, mixture boys and girls and both. And they said, how about if we teach you the music and you take turns this Sunday, this group, you sit on the platform and play and sing with us. And then the next week, you sit on the platform and play and sing with us. These kids said, sure. Well, when your son or daughter is on the platform, that's a concert. Who comes to concerts? Parents, grandparents, if you're Asian, great, great grandparents, great, 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 great grandparents. I mean, they come. And by the time the deadline hit, half the people on the platform were not white and they were under 40. Two years later, the same weekend, literally two years actually, I was invited to preach at the Campsie Church. When I stood up to preach, there were 240 people in worship, not 70. And up on the wall of the worship center were the 37 flags of the 37 nationalities that now attended that church. And in those last two years, they had seen over 40 people become brand new disciples of Jesus. Who does that? It's the glorified, resurrected Lord who says to you and says to me, if you want to be in a church and you want to see that candle burn brightly, you do what I say. You put me first. You don't make it about yourself, but you make it about those people who need to hear the good news of the gospel. And your candle will burn. And if you don't do that, I'll go around and I'll blow the candle out. The vision God gives to us is of a Savior who died on the cross. We need that vision. But he's also the glorified, resurrected Lord who came out of the tomb, who was given back his glory, and he says, I will build my church with those who follow me. And when a church does that, there is great hope. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our gracious God, Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and being willing to be in that human body, to be willing to be crucified, to be willing to die in our place. But, Father, thank you for giving your son back his glory. And I pray for Bethel Presbyterian Church that you will give this church 
a complete vision of who Jesus is. That the candle here in this whole area around Cornelius might be changed to see the vision 200 achieved because they put Jesus' message and mission first. Would you do that for the sake of people in this community who need Jesus? But would you also do it for your honor and your glory and your reputation? For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Borden, thank you. And as we begin to kind of bring our thoughts together about communion, I just want us to pause for a moment. Stay in this, stay in that space of prayer. Whether it's close your eyes or have them open. And I just want to let the Holy Spirit speak to us for a moment now. So I'm just going to be quiet. And just let the Holy Spirit speak. We praise you, O oh God, for your word. Thank you for your vision. That our hope is not in ourselves, but is in you, and that you are glorified. You have received all your glory back from the Father. And that you are the conqueror. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for speaking to us. We're not together in body right now. Amen, by the way. But the Holy Spirit has drawn us together as the body of Christ. It's one of the wonderful things about the pandemic. There's been a lot to resist and get argumentative about but the thing that I have appreciated about it has woken me up to a whole different understanding about how the church can be together as the body of Christ. So often we depended on this building. But we discovered if we let the Holy Spirit speak to us that we can be the body of Christ in diaspora too. That's a place where God's people just flourish and they have for centuries, thousands of years. They flourished. We have flourished when we have been apart. Communion isn't just about something that the local church does by itself. It's a sacrament that allows God's people, wherever we are, to be united with the whole church, present, past, future, the Holy Spirit. And we're enacting our solidarity with persecuted Christians. Think about that. It's not just Bethel that takes communion. We are saying we are in solidarity with persecuted Christians. In solidarity with, solidarity with marginalized brothers and sisters. And anyone who shares Christ's song on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that. But in the resurrection, God showed that he had not forsaken his son. And he does not abandon us. So welcome to this table of amazing grace. Let me pray real quick with you all. Gracious God, we know we don't deserve your grace, yet you've called us into relationship with you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with him, that we may be one with all who share this feast and united in ministry with your people in every place. In the holy name we pray. Amen. We remember the supper just as Paul 
gave it to us to remember that on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembering me. And we also remember that after the supper, he took the cup. It was a third cup. It was called the cup of redemption. And he said words over that cup that forever changed its meaning for them and for all generations of Christians. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of this cup, do so remembering me. And as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the day that we will take this supper with him, no longer as strangers, but face to face as friends. Today we're going to be taking bread and the cup with those little packets that you received. I never thought as long as I have lived as a Presbyterian minister that I would be doing this. But here we are. Change happens. So we have this cup. What you do is you peel off those two different areas. You peel the sealed, the clear plastic one first, and that will reveal the wafer that's there. And then underneath that is the purple. You peel that back, and then that's your juice. Okay? So people at home, we're taking this with you. Here we take it, take it together here. Do it as you wish. But these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And as we take communion, we will hear some music piece with us. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we've heard your word today. We've sung your praise. We've shared in the supper that declares that with you, we are a people of reconciliation. Whatever commitments we have made, help us now to keep them. Amen.
So our ending of the services from now on will go a little different than where we're used to. We're going to display uh, what I'm going to say. We're going to declare boldly what we're for as a church. This is our Bethel 200 mission statement. And so please, if you're able, please rise. And I will ask you, people of God, what, what are we for? Serving people to ignite a lifelong passion for Jesus Christ. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you the rest of this day, this week, and until we meet again, whether it be on this earth or in his glorious paradise. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Parents, go pick up your children, and thank you for joining us.